Good morning. Good morning. Today's Bible reading will be from Leviticus chapter 25, uh, eight, verses 8 through 11 and 20 through 22, as well as Luke 4, verses 14 through 19. The year of Jubilee. Count off seven Sabbath years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath years among, amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee year for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? I will send such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. While you plant during the eighth year, you will eat from the old crop and will continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Thanks, Travis. Uh, my name is Ryan. I am one of the pastors over here, and Joy is my sister, just in case you're visiting and you don't know that. Uh, and she didn't ask me to, to uh, prepare anything. I just, she just called me up earlier on, which is why it's funny. So, just want to fill everyone in on that. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, um, I am going to be continuing in a series, uh, Dethroning Race. Uh, also, if you're new, what we're doing at the moment is we are uh, doing teaching material on, on this topic, and then on Tuesdays, we're meeting for, um, for times where we can have discussion workshops. And so, if you find this interesting or something you want to engage in, uh, then please do join us on Tuesdays. Uh, there's also a book that I've written, which you can purchase. It's in the, the book, um, in, the, in the section over there, and you can purchase it. What is it called again? Information <laughs> Place. Um, and then uh, what we try and do is every week, I try and give you a little bit of a, a punt for different things that you can read. If, if you find the topic interesting or difficult, uh, and you want to keep reading some more, today's um, topic is, um, uh, here's a book that you can listen, that you can read. Uh, it's called Good News and Good Works by Ronald J. Sider. Uh, Ronald Sider is a theologian uh, from the States, and uh, he's written a book on the topic that we're going to be speaking about now. Um, and so it gives you a lot more information, and it's a super helpful um, book to read. So what we want to do now is today we're looking at the question, what is the gospel? So what I want you to do is, if you've got a little device or you've got a piece of paper and pen, I want you to write down as I give an intro what you think the gospel is. Just write down a couple of words associated to what, how you define the gospel, and then you can keep glancing at that as I go along. Because maybe there is more to the gospel, this very basic idea that all Christians generally have some sort of view on. Maybe there's more to it than what we first realized. So you can go ahead and write down what you think the gospel is before I jump into the intro, which is a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, uh, theological history, a little bit of church history for all the theological um, nerds out there like me. Uh, you're going to enjoy this, okay? It's a little bit of church history. Okay, so in 1966, Billy Graham, along with John Stott, 
were the two leading voices in the evangelical Protestant world. They were like the Tim Kellers of, of that time, 1960s, okay? And in 1966, um, they were so popular. John Stott, particularly, the one on that side, he was so popular that Time magazine said, if evangelicals could elect a pope, John Stott is the person they would likely choose. So everyone knows Billy Graham, but you might not know that John Stott was actually uh, one of the main theological voices in the evangelical world at the time. And so they um, hosted in the, in the 60s, um, a conference in Berlin where they wanted to re-examine the relationship between the gospel and social work. And the whole drive of this conference that we're engaging with the World Council of Churches and a whole bunch of ecumenical movements, the whole goal of the conference in 1964 in Berlin was to basically say that, that the, the, the church, the Protestant church, had gone too far in terms of, social, in terms of prioritizing social work and including it in the gospel. They were concerned about what we have come to now use the language, a social gospel. That's what they were concerned about, Billy Graham and John Stott. And so, in John Stott's word, they set out to re-examine their marching orders. John Stott, in 1964, said, The commission of the church is not to reform society. You see that? The commission of the church is not to reform society, but to preach the gospel the prime is, the, is to be gospel herods, not social reformers. Do you see what they're saying? Now, just bear in mind, if you can just go back to the previous slide, what is happening in the 1960s? In the 1960s, we are in South Africa in the heart of apartheid, okay? And you've got John Stott and Billy Graham saying, our job is not to reform society. In the 1960s, you're in the heart of the civil rights, you, you, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, that's happening in the 1960s. In the 1960s, the, there are many countries that are just becoming free from colonial occupation. So that's what's happening in Africa. That's what's happening across the world. It's a time of great uh, activism against racism in the 1960s. And you've got John Stott, the two leading evangelical voices, and Billy Graham, Graham saying that our job is not to reform society. Billy Graham and John Stott then meet a young Latin American theologian named Rene Padilla. And in Latin America, they also are grappling with what it means to be a post-colonial society. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of poverty. There's all sorts of issues very similar to South Africa right now. So, so Rene Padilla is pastoring a, a bunch of churches. And uh, Rene Padilla, for example, just to give you a sense of what he's dealing with, he once said in, during the time, young people ask questions regarding the Christian attitude towards a Marxist regime while the pastors discuss the length of the skirts that girls are wearing in the church. You see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, we're, we're dealing, we need to deal with these other issues also. That gives you a sense of the context that he's in. So, so John Stott becomes friends with Rene Padilla, Billy Graham not so much. So John Stott and Rene Padilla have an awesome friendship, and their friendship grows over the 10-year period from 1964, where they had that Berlin conference, and Rene Padilla believes that the gospel has got application for countries where there is poverty, for countries where there's racial tension. And he develops the language of the holistic gospel, saying that we need to preach the whole gospel, not just one aspect of the gospel. And we then have to have what he calls integral mission, uh, a mission that is not just, about, um, not just about evangelism, but also about caring for the poor. The gospel is good news for the poor. It's also about a kingdom that comes in. And, and this friendship starts to change John Stott's views on things. So, 10 years go by, and John Stott and Billy Graham decide to have another conference. This conference is called the Lausanne Conference. And at the Lausanne Conference in 1974, this is now 10 years later, Billy Graham stands up, and he basically re-emphasizes what he said 10 years prior, 1964, at his Berlin conference. And he once again wants to prioritize evangelism and deprioritize social work. And he says this, he says, I'm convinced if the church went back to its main task of proclaiming the gospel and getting people converted to Christ, it would have far greater impact on the social, moral, and psychological needs of men than any other thing it could possibly do. So Billy Graham believed you just have to plant the seed, and then social change will come. 
It will come naturally. You don't have to teach people. You don't have to do anything else. Just plant a seed. Social change will come. And um, much of the direction of the conference then boiled down to what John Stott would say at this conference. And everybody thought John Stott was going to say the same thing he said 10 years prior. But things had changed for John Stott because of his relationship with Rene Padilla. So much so that John Stott stood up and disagreed publicly with Billy Graham. And he then said, today, however, I would express myself differently. It is not just that the commission includes a duty to teach converts everything Jesus previously commanded, and that social responsibility is among the things which Jesus commanded. I now see more clearly that not only the consequences of the commission, but the actual commission itself must be understood to include social as well as evangelistic responsibility, unless we are to be guilty of distorting the words of Jesus. That's completely different to what he said 10 years prior. And the conference was shook. I mean, there was massive, it was, it was dramatic. This is better than watching Days of Our Lives if you go and read books on what happened here. I promise you, it was dramatic. John Stott basically had a fight with Billy Graham at this conference. Billy Graham was, was more popular, and so everybody was going to go with his vision. John Stott publicly said, if we go along this route, I'm leaving this conference publicly. They had to get locked in a room together to, to sort this out. And so, um, and so they get locked in a room together, and they come up with something called the Lausanne Covenant, which is probably one of the most significant theological treaties of our age and has been very influential. The one line in the Lausanne Covenant, which was this negotiated thing, says, we affirm that evangelism and sociopolitical involvement are both part of our Christian duty. The salvation we claim should be transforming us in the totality of our personal and social responsibility. This is where we get the idea of, of, of whole person discipleship. We can't leave your political views to the politicians. No, no, no. Jesus is Lord over that also. Jesus is Lord over how we think about money. Jesus is Lord over how we think about ethics and issues of race. And so John Stott had this massive change because of a friendship that he had with somebody who was reading the Bible and doing ministry in a different context to what he was. And um, this friendship had ripple effects because uh, this language of holistic gospel and integral mission became used, it started to get used by all sorts of different institutions. Uh, the many churches joined the fight for liberation in all sorts of places, Africa and the United States. Uh, Time magazine said this about the conference in 1964. It was a formidable forum, possibly the widest ranges, ranging meeting of Christians ever held. And as a result of that friendship, Hundreds of millions of, of dollars and rands got spent on building churches and building orphanages, on helping the poor and preaching the gospel. And this language of holistic gospel got embraced by many movements, World Vision, Com uh, Compassion International, Food for the Hungry, International Justice Mission, World Relief, and New Frontiers, the broader group that we're a part of, just to mention a few. And so it just shows how important it is for us to engage in conversation because we all come to the text from different perspectives and how also it, how important it is to talk about the gospel, the gospel, this fundamental question. And this has led people like Tim Keller to say the gospel is not a simple thing. By that, he means what Billy Graham and John Stott were talking about, that it's got all sorts of aspects and dynamics to it. So I want us to talk about what is the gospel. This is a message about gospel clarity, because as is the seed of the gospel, so is the tree of your life, and as is the tree, so are the fruit. We have to start with the Old Testament. Okay, when you do a biblical theology of any topic, you want to start with the whole Bible and look at how the, the, the content gets developed. Now, the Old Testament provides like a, uh, an introduction to the gospel. And in that introduction, you get a sense of what you're going to experience, what the Messiah is going to be like, and what His salvation will be. It, it gives you a sense of what you must expect. But now, if you miss the introduction, okay, then you won't know what to expect in the New Testament. They say in the New Testament, the time has come. But if you miss the Old Testament, you might go, what time? What, what time? What, what, what do you mean? What's the time? 
The time has come. Just as He promised our ancestors. What promise? If you miss the Old Testament promises, it's like watching a movie and then you miss the introduction because your friend is talking the whole time. I'm that friend always talking. And then you miss the introduction and then you don't know what's happening in the movie. Okay? And beginning with Moses and the, all the prophets, He explained to them, this is Jesus taking up the Old Testament, He explained to them what He said in all the Old Testament scriptures concerning Himself. The Old Testament points to Jesus and his salvation. And so we need to look at what the Old Testament has to say as this introductory text so that we can have a sense of expectation about what the gospel, what God's salvation will be like. And there's lots of different passages we could look at. We're just going to look at the Leviticus 25 passage, the Jubilee passage. In verse 9 in Leviticus 25, it says, Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day, of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, the day where the lamb was sacrificed, the day of atonement, should sound the trumpet throughout your land. So on the day of atonement, they would sound a trumpet. And on the day of atonement, when the trumpet is sounded, that would inaugurate the jubilee. And three things would happen on the day of atonement. Number one, the slaves were all freed. That trumpet would sound, pa pa ra pa 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 and if you were a slave, if you were indebted, you, 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 were, you were free. You were free. What amazing grace. The second thing that would happen is ancestral land was returned. So if you lost land because you were indebted and you had to sell your ancestral land, your, your land was returned. Imagine the trumpet sounded from Ned Bank, pa pa ra pa 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 <laughs> Debt written off. Credit card cleared. All your debt, home loan paid for in full. Imagine you had lost everything. Imagine you became a slave. You lost everything. Man, this was monumental grace to people. And then the third aspect of the Jubilee, when the trumpet sounded, you would get rest for a whole year from working. Imagine Joe Burgers. <gasps> Work-life balance restored. No bags under the eyes. Sleeping through the night. Man, this would do wonders for us. And there's another sermon in here about trusting God, about trusting God and not working too hard. So why is God doing this? Why is God giving them the jubilee? Remember, Leviticus comes just after the exodus. They had been slaves in Egypt. And that slavery got into their minds. The empire didn't only enslave their bodies. The empire enslaved their minds. It, it, lim it limits empires. Always try and limit how you think and answer all your worldview questions so that you don't have a prophetic imagination. So you're not thinking, I wonder if God is interested in my liberation, in my salvation. And so God gives them a gospel worldview to open up their minds, to set them free from, from thinking because empire will always limit your prophetic imagination and will punish you if you try and change things and you start to dream of about what could be. But God's gospel always comes like the rock. Daniel's picture. Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, there's this picture of a statue and it's got the head of gold and it's got silver and it's got bronze. And he says, these are different kingdoms. They're powerful, they're great. But another kingdom is coming. This rock that comes from the outside and it comes and smashes the statue to pieces. All the kingdoms of the world get undermined by the kingdom of God, the gospel which comes and opens up our minds opens up our thinking to who God is and what God can do. That's the process. That's what the gospel does. That's why the gospel undermines. It's not a violent undermine. It's not a violent smashing, but he, he sets people free so that they become redemptive agents wherever they find themselves, in their places of work, wherever they find themselves. That's what the gospel does. And so God gives them a new worldview, a new mindset. They had been slaves. And God says, I want you to treat each other in a gospel way. I love you. You're not a slave, okay? And I want you to treat each other in the way that I treat you. It gives them something that completely rewires them, okay? So there's four different headings in summary. To summarize the jubilee, the gospel concealed in the Old Testament, four things. Number one was about God's sovereignty, okay? That God is saying, I'm God, and I want you to be generous with one another, and I want you to trust me. The farmers say, obviously, understandably, they say in verse 20, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? That's a good question to ask. We can't work for a year. Great, fantastic, but what do we eat? Because we're not working, we're not harvesting. God says to them in verse 21, 
I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. Trust me, for one year, I'll provide because I'm sovereign. I'm God. And if I tell you to be generous, I will provide for you. Trust God. Trust God. Don't overwork. Be generous and trust God. Okay, so it's about God's sovereignty. Number two, it's about God's justice. It's about God's ethic. God's giving them a new ethic. They were enslaved. And God says to them, I want you to treat each other differently. I don't want you to enslave each other. I don't want my children enslaved. That's, a, that's wrong. What happened to you was wrong. Don't do that. Don't treat each other that way. And so he says in verse 14 and in verse 17, do not take advantage of each other. Why? Because I am the Lord. Out of reverence for God, treat each other with love and with grace. And then it's about God's saving grace. It's about God's saving grace, okay? There's a co-mingling between the timing of the event, okay? So what is the timing? It's the exodus. They've just been liberated. And the content of the event, what's the content? It's, it happens on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement. What happens on the Day of Atonement? They slay the lamb. What does that represent? That represents the fact that you don't work for your salvation. It's because of the blood of the lamb that you're set free. If you're sitting here today and you want to know what is the gospel, I want to tell you the gospel is a message about someone who's died in your place for your sins. He became sin who knew no sin, so that in him you could become the righteousness of God. Amen. That's what it's about. It's about the lamb that was slain. This points forward to something. So on the day of atonement, when the lamb is slain for the people's sins, they are liberated from Egypt and God is telling them that your salvation, your liberation is by sheer, unmerited kindness and grace of God. You don't have to work to earn your salvation. You don't have to we get things wrong all the time. We will. But God loves you. He loves you the same way if you do things wrong, He loves you still. When you don't get things right, He loves you still. It's about grace. Number four, it's about God's restoration of all things. Okay? So, so obviously we can see that things are being restored over here. If you don't work for a year, even the animals got to rest. The animals got to rest. The soil got to rest. You know the scientists, I just saw this thing the other day. The scientists discovered that soil needs to rest because if you over, over farm the soil, the, the, you know, there's also toxins in the food. The soil needs to rest. Uh, so so it, was, it was rest for the whole environment. It was a kindness to the animals. The people got to rest. It stopped inequalities from developing because every 50 years, land was returned. So that stopped one person from getting everything and another person from having nothing. God's heart is that there wouldn't be these massive inequalities. You want your children not to live like that. You don't want one child having everything and one child having nothing. No, no, no. God wants his children to have restoration. And part of that restoration, part of that shalom is about not having massive inequalities, not having massive monopolies, not having injustice. Okay? So it was about the restoration of things, the renewal of things. And the prophets got hold of this. And throughout the prophets, they start saying that there is going to be a Jubilee 2.0. There's going to be a jubilee on steroids, not just a jubilee in a province like Israel, but a jubilee that was going to have cosmic dimensions. Isaiah, for example, speaks about this new jubilee as the year of the Lord's favor. And the New Testament is going to pick up on that language. And whenever you see the year of the Lord's favor, like in Luke 4, you know what they're talking about. They're talking about this jubilee over here, Leviticus 25. But it's going to be like a new, greater, grander jubilee that an even greater Messiah would usher in. So Isaiah, for example, I'm just going to read this passage. We don't have time to unpack it, but there's many places where this happens. See, I will create the new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. Verse 20, never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. You see, they're speaking about a new jubilee. At, 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 the, at the renewal of all things, when heaven gets established on earth, this is what it's talking about. This is the promise. The one who dies at 100 will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach 100 will be considered a, a cursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. I mean, doesn't our country need that? This new jubilee? Okay. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. 
For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long, will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. Okay, God is going to be with you perfectly. This is what's coming. The kingdom of heaven, when it's fully established, there'll be no separation between us and God. We'll, we'll, he'll hear us. And then even the environment. Look, the animals and the, the environment is going to be changed. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. No more BBC documentaries about the wolf <laughs> eating the lamb. Okay? And the lion will eat straw like the ox and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. What are you doing when you tell somebody, I want you to believe in God who is sovereign, and then I want you to live your life in a different way. I want you to have a, 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 a God's justice ethic. And then I want you to believe in God's grace that he died in your place for your sins. And I want you to put your hope in a future restoration of all things. You're telling that person to believe the gospel. You're telling that person to become a Christian. That's what you're doing. So in this Leviticus 25 passage, you've got a foreshadowing of the gospel. And we start to see that what we need to be expecting from God's gospel is that it's both a message about personal renewal. Like John Stott was saying, it's about personal renewal, yes, but it's also so much bigger than that. It's about the renewal of absolutely everything. John Stott would later say that the gospel is like a bird with two wings. On the one wing, you've got this message of justification by faith, and it's a message of grace. But on the other wing, you've got this message about a kingdom that's coming and the, the renewal of absolutely everything. And if the bird doesn't have both of its wings, it veers off into one or the other side. If it veers off into the one side, it veers off into moralism and a social gospel. And it's all about the good works, and it's tiring and exhausting. If it doesn't have the other wing of the kingdom, it veers off into individualism and my... Christianity becomes all about me, 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 me. We need both wings. So fast forward a couple of hundred years to a little synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus stands up in the synagogue and he preaches Luke chapter 4. Okay, And we see the opening phrase. It says, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. What is that telling us? That is telling us that salvation is going to be cosmic. Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit because you know what happened before this. He went to battle against Satan in the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days and Satan tempted him and he overcame Satan. Why does, G why does the Spirit drive Jesus into the wilderness? G G you know, it's not like Satan came to Jesus. Jesus went to Satan. Why does he do that? Why does he go and pick a fight with, with Satan? Why, why does he overcome Satan right at the beginning, which is a taste of things to come? Because from here, he's going to heal the sick. He's going to cast out demons. He's going to, he's going to institute a kingdom that is good news for the poor and everyone else. Why does he do that? Because he comes to pull up the taproot of all evil. His salvation is not just going to be about one particular evil thing that's happening in Israel. No, no, no. His salvation is going to be cosmic. He's come to overthrow Satan, the author of all evil, the one that is behind everything that is wrong, the one that's behind abuse, the one that's behind genocide, the one that's behind all evil empires that seek to limit our imagination about what could be. He has come to stop Satan. He's come to, to pull up the taproot. And on the cross, he's going to make a public spectacle of Satan and his demons. And he's going to overcome them on the cross. Why is that important? It's important because when you begin to have your eyes opened to injustice and evil, and you start to stand up for what is true and live out the kingdom way, you're going to experience pushback. And you're going to get tired and spiritual warfare. And you need to know that your king, your Lord Jesus has come to overthrow Satan. And he is victorious over Satan. And his kingdom is like that, that rock that comes to smash and break every other kingdom. He is all-powerful. And his salvation is cosmic. And when we as a church go and, and follow him and bear witness to his kingdom, we're going in his power and in his authority. Jesus reigns. Jesus rules. And nothing and no one, not even the gates of Hades, can prevail against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. His salvation, number one, is cosmic. 
That's the first thing we see. Number two, we see that his salvation is the new jubilee. His salvation is the new jubilee. Verse 18 says, he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Obviously, we should expect to see that because it was in the introduction. Okay? It was in the, the, the jubilee. It was, was there in Leviticus 25. So we would expect that his salvation would be good news to the poor. And then the word aphesis is used twice, three times actually. It's the, it's the Greek word for liberation that's used in Leviticus 25. Freedom, liberation. The, the freedom of the captives to set the prisoners free. Okay, it's used a few times. And then it's explicitly mentioned by the reference to Isaiah's year of the Lord's favor. Verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is this jubilee that the prophet said was coming. Jesus says, it has come. His jubilee has come. And his gospel, his kingdom is about this new ethic that's good news for the poor. So secondly, salvation is to be understood as a jubilee. And then thirdly, his salvation is to be understood as a kingdom that's coming. It's a kingdom. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Who gets anointed in the Bible? Yes, Jesus. Jesus is always the right answer. <laughs> Any other answers? Kings. Kings got anointed in the Bible. What did they get anointed by? Oil. By the prophets with oil. But Jesus gets anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's a king on a different scale. He's the king of kings. And Jesus comes to establish a kingdom. And his kingdom is a kingdom of renewal, where everything that is broken with the world is made new. The Israelites had this longing for a day when this king would come, like South Africans have a longing for a day when a good president will come. <laughs> when Rasi becomes president. <laughs> We long for it. A, 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 a king, a, a president who will rule in, in the people's interest, who will not be corrupt. We long for it. We know. We understand. The Israelites had a longing like this. They longed for their, for their king to come, the promised Messiah to come. But they didn't realize that this king would not only be the king of Israel, but it would be the king of kings and the king of all people. That the king would come with a kingdom that was not just about Israel and provincial, but it would be the king, the kingdom that would reign over all other kingdoms. This is the king that comes. And this kingdom is simple. Even kids understand it. It's a whole new world breaking into this old world. A whole new world. A new fantastic point of view. Right? Even kids understand this longing for a world where right wins where wrong doesn't win. Even kids understand this longing for a world where all that is broken is made right and restored. A world where people live in harmony together. A world where there's no wars. A world where there's no inequality and poverty and abuse and violence. That's what the kingdom is. The king has come to establish that type of world. And that world is coming. That world that you're longing for. If you're visiting with us uh, and you're looking into... Like, we want me to get into the juicy stuff of racism and, and DEI. Let me tell you, the only place you're going to find what you're longing for is in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's where you find it. Amen. His kingdom is coming, it's, and it's already started. But, and it will come in its fullness, but you're not going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You'll get tastes, tastes of it, glimpses of it, perhaps. But, but, the, but what you're longing for is found in Christ and in His kingdom. In the Bible, there's two places where this word for renewal is used, the exact same word. Paul uses it to speak about personal re renewal. It says, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What is that? That's personal renewal. That's what happens when you become a Christian. When I become a Christian and you slowly become renewed and Jesus makes you new and he changes your desires, uh, I, you know, and he makes you, and he, the Holy Spirit over time, it doesn't happen instantly, but over time he makes you new and changes you. That's wonderful. All of us who have been born again are experiencing this renewal. Some of us slowly, <laughs> me, my hand is up, but all of us are experiencing this renewal that's happening in our lives. Jesus says that is not the whole gospel. 
that's a part of something that he's doing to the rest of the cosmos. Everything is going to be renewed. When Jesus spoke about, he uses the same word in Matthew's gospel in, verse, in chapter 19. He says, at the renewal of all things. Truly, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things. Jesus is going to do what he's done to you on a grand scale to everything else. Paul picks up on this idea. He says that even the environment, even the earth, the cosmos is waiting for its liberation from bondage to decay. The whole, everything is waiting for this renewal to be ushered in. And, and your personal salvation is part of this bigger renewal of absolutely everything. There's so much to talk about by the book. Even the word salvation, even the word saved doesn't mean saved. It means, uh, it means healing and it means forgiveness. It means all of those things, the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew word, the Greek word, that's what it means. Sometimes Jesus even says it, like you can see it in the English. He says, oh, what is it easy for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or take up your mat and walk. He's, he's talking about the same thing. So it's the same but different. He's saying, listen, I'm doing something. I'm bringing a renewal of all things. Your personal salvation is part of this bigger salvation. My wife is Japanese and my, my mom-in-law is very Japanese. And um, they, they practice this thing called kintsugi. It's, it's, it's this art of not throwing away broken things and instead putting gold or silver lacquer on broken things and mending it. Even in your redemption, God doesn't throw you away. He doesn't throw away broken people. He doesn't throw away a broken world. He comes and he mends you. And even in your redemption, there's even greater beauty because of the scars. Hey, listen, though my father and my mother will forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Amen. He's the God who mends what is broken. He's the God who renovates. He's the God who fixes. He renews. He's not like me. When it comes to DIY, I don't like it. I'll be honest. Can I get an amen? amen. Brothers, any other men out there who hate DIY? This is Liberation Sunday. <laughs> I almost broke my arm trying to fix the pool pump. The nuts are so tight. It's like, ah, it's just, can somebody else do this? I see that hand, brothers. God's not like that. He comes and he says, I'm not going to throw broken people away. I'm not going to throw a broken world away. I'm going to renew it. I'm making all things new. You, you're going to be new. But not only you, he's going to renew the relationships between us. There's going to be no... No racism in heaven. There's going to be no injustice in heaven. I mean, the, the environment's going to be made new. Everything is going to be made new. That's what he's doing. His salvation is on a grand scale. And it's important for us to know that, that your salvation, my personal salvation, is part of something far bigger. It starts with me, but it doesn't end with me. A couple of months ago, Megan became a Christian. Can you put that, that slide up of Megan getting baptized? I don't know, Megan, are you here? Megan um, uh, became a Christian as, as, through our Itemba program. We've got a program that Wandi started because we wanted to help people who had addictions. We were trying to get people jobs and trying to do skills development. And then we realized, man, we need to do addiction help also because, you know, people get jobs, but then they, they fall back. Anyway, we meet Megan. Megan needs help with um, addiction stuff. She comes from a family where this is the history. She's born into this stuff. So from a young age, she's already addicted. And, and nobody has any time for Megan. We one day befriends her. We help her. We need money. We go and ask somebody for money uh, because we don't have money to start the NGO. We start the NGO, and, um, and, and Megan uh, gets into the rehab. I don't know how long it lasted, a couple of days, and then she was back. She backslid after the program, and that happened about three or four times. And then we had to go and ask people for money again because we didn't have money, we ran out of money. And, uh, and, and I was like, we can't, we, we, you know, we've got a limited budget one day. We can't keep helping, you know. And I don't know what it was. I think it was the third time or fourth time, and Megan becomes a Christian the third time or the fourth time in rehab. And uh, then she gets baptized. And, and now she's working. She got a job. She went through the skills program. Why? Because as a church, we are prioritizing both wings. You, you can't just say to people, God loves you, but I'm not going to spend any money on you. Yes. It's about a kingdom that's coming. 
And it's, it, it changes how we think about money. And there are people that are, that are saying, no, listen, we, we're going to prioritize both wings. These things, they work together. We need both wings to work together. And it produces change in people. And so um, what, what we see over here is that the Lord Jesus commanded us and his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. What does that mean to you? The gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus commanded you to preach. Look at it. Verse 10. I mean, Matthew 10, verse 7. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. He's commanded that. That's why when we see what the disciples did, they practiced that. That was their practice. They proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, what was Philip doing? Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. That was his practice. What was Paul doing? For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And is this just for them? Was it just for that time? Is this a new dispensation now? Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Until the end, we keep doing this. The church keeps doing this. The church keeps planting churches and orphanages. The keep keeps praying for the sick and the leading people to Jesus. These things work together. They keep, we keep on doing it. So the call is for you and I to repent and believe the good news of the kingdom of God. Mark 1.15. That's what Jesus said, right? What does it mean to repent? It means to turn. The Greek soldiers would be marching in one direction. They would shout, repent. And everyone would turn in the opposite direction. Jesus says, listen, my kingdom has come. The time has come. And you might have been walking in a particular direction. When the kingdom comes, I want you to repent now. And to believe the kingdom and to follow him. It's not just about saying a prayer and then going to heaven one day. No, it's about, about following Jesus and his kingdom way in the year and in the now. If you had only monocultural friendships because of the abnormality of the society that you grew up in, because you were contextually indoctrinated to believe that is normal, Jesus says, I want you to now repent because in the kingdom there's no Jew, no Gentile, no slave, no free. For all are one in Christ. I've come to break down every dividing wall of hostility. Wherever you might find yourself, in South Africa, black, white, or Serbs and Croats in the former Yugoslavia, or Hutsis and Tutsis, if you come into the kingdom, you repent, you start living out a kingdom way. If you, the way you think about structural stuff and politics and ethics, if there's a practice in your company that's not kingdom, Jesus says, hey, listen, repent, believe, start to walk in, and usher in the kingdom where you are. If people pay the domestic workers a certain amount, like they do in this country, and it's okay. It's not okay in England, hey? It's this year. You can underpay people. Even though it's legal, it's not just. It's not kingdom. Repent. Believe. A new way. See, the, the, the systems of this world are constantly trying to get us to compromise and to become part of it. And Jesus says, I have come with a kingdom, and I want you to repent and believe. He called them out of the Essenes. He called them out of the Pharisees. He called them out of the... I mean, one of his, one of his guys belonged to the MK, the Mkonto Essenes, where Simon the Zealot. You know what Simon the Zealot used to do for a living before he became a Christ follower? He used to kill Romans. That's what he did. Jesus says, no, 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 repent, believe. I've got a new way for you, a kingdom way. Beloved, this is not critical race theory. This is not politics. This is kingdom. We're called to a new way. Jesus is calling us to a new way. So the kingdom of God has come. This leaves us with three ways to live. I'm going to land. I'm almost done. Number one, you can believe a, a gospel that is all about good works. We didn't spend enough time explaining that. The gospel is not about good works. It's about salvation by faith through justification because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. You need to believe that. Listen, if you, if you believe that, that it's just kingdom, it's only kingdom, then your salvation is going to be all about you doing good things to impress God. And your operating system is going to be my good works are the most important thing to God. And that's exhausting. That's a terrible way to live. Jesus died for sinners. Here is a trustworthy saying. 
Christ has died for sinners, of which I am the worst. So we're not called to a moralistic social gospel. We're not called to this. The second way to get this wrong is to believe in a gospel that is only about my personal salvation. And that leads to a different operating system, an operating system that becomes very individualistic. It, it becomes about a Christianity that is just about saying a prayer, and then I go to heaven one day. I've got the fire insurance. I'm not going to hell. And so I'm just waiting for that, okay? And then it's just me, 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 me. How I live is irrelevant. How I treat people is irrelevant. How I prioritize friendships is irrelevant. My, how I think about marriage doesn't have to change because it's just me, 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 me. I prioritize me all the time. An individualistic gospel. Jesus has come to do more than that. Your salvation is part of something far bigger. He's come to renew everything. And this calls us to embracing the whole of the gospel. The holistic gospel which is about a kingdom that has come. And it's also about justification by faith. And it causes us to say, my personal renewal is part of God's renewal of the world that I get to participate in. Listen, friends, it's so important that our definition for the gospel is right, that it's clear, that we have gospel clarity. I speak to people all the time that believe a prosperity gospel. And it produces in their life a concern with amassing material things. And then when suffering comes and sickness comes and there's no money, they believe God doesn't love them and God is not for them. As is the seed, the gospel seed that you believe, so is the tree. As is the tree, so are the fruit. And we are called to embrace the whole of the gospel. Let me give the second last word to the reformer. Thomas Casey was a Puritan and he said this. Reform all places, all persons and callings. Reform the benches of judgment, the inferior magistrates. Reform the universities, reform the cities. Reform the countries, reform the inferior schools of learning. Reform the Sabbath, reform the ordinances, the worship of God. You have more work to do than I can speak. God First Church, you have more work to do than any one of us can speak. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. I'm going to say a quick prayer for us, and then we're going to watch a short video, a five-minute, six-minute video about different ways that you can get involved, practical things. But just in this moment, maybe you just where you seat, just stretch your hands in front of you. Lord Jesus, we want to receive a fresh commissioning. Thank you so much for your salvation towards us that you're renewing us. Day by day, we know that you are renewing us. We remember the day we received your forgiveness for, for, for the first time, and it was beautiful. And if that's you today, I want to say, won't you put your faith in Christ? Let today be the day of salvation for you. Come to Jesus. He loves you. He's died in your place for your sins. And Lord, we also want to bring the King. We want to bear witness to your renewal program. Thank you that through your Holy Spirit, you are renewing all things. and We want to be part of that movement. Won't you fill us up and send us out? Lord, where we are complicit with the kingdoms of this world. Right now, we want to pray for forgiveness. And we want to repent and believe the good news of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.